Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the Cinema Wave Podcast. We are back again to talk about the newest episode of The Penguin. The name of the episode is Chentani. It is episode four, the mid-season uh, finale of season one of this HBO drama, The Penguin, which is based in the Matt Reeves universe, based on The Batman. I am one of your hosts. My name is Darren Scalamoni. I am joined, as always, by Vinny Albano. Hello, hello. Uh, this is taking us in the direction of Sophia Falcone. Yeah. In particular. And we did say on last week's episode when we covered um, episode three, which a lot of that had to do with um, Victor's story and his relationship with Oz, that um, it was it was shown in the preview that we were going to get this big flashback episode. A majority of the episode is in flashback. Um, this is a great episode of television, man. This oh, is, yeah. This is something yeah. that that you only get, like, usually it's in, like, the, that, like – upper quadrant of the tv season when you get an episode like this that sticks in your mind and i thought that chantani might be the best episode of the season so far i i agree with that i this episode is just honestly breathtaking and it's so it's like right up my alley honestly it's such a subversion to to all the episodes that have come before this and also showing that perspective, we barely get any Oz in this, you know. He's there a little bit, yeah. but it's really just Sophia, Sophia, Sophia. And Christi- uh, Christina uh, Milioti does such a good job. Like, I was je- like, she honestly, I think, was out acting almost every other performer and yeah. every scene that she was in. 100%. I think Kristen Milioti basically completely confirmed she's at least getting a nomination with this episode yeah for the emmys and definitely the golden globes but the emmys especially as well which is it's also really interesting we've we had this conversation on last week's episode about this being based on comic book ip and what that means and and what they could do going forward and um even in our first episode where we covered episodes one and two we talked Mm -hmm. about the discussion of how grounded this was comparatively to the fantastical elements of not only batman but the penguin as a character Mm. this is a showcase for the realism that can come out of the show that can make it feel like it's so much more than the unfortunate reality of like having like comic book attached to um, what your project is. Like the tendencies are kind of crazy. Um, I think that the biggest thing for me is that we, what the team behind the penguin are able to do with this show and especially with this episode Hmm is really showcase that you don't need to make everything that's based on IP, that's based on big budgets, based on comic books, based on these big properties, all one note. Like, Hmm. this is perfectly emblematic of, like, taking something and really making it your own within, and while still not, like, necessarily pointing a finger at a character in a way that maybe, like, Joker Folly You Do did, like, which we discussed on the channel. This is a perfectly encapsulated drama about this character going through this neuro, uh, this psychotic break due to being placed in Arkham, which we get on full display in this episode. Yeah, yeah. It is, it's powerful. I think, I mean, jumping right into it, one of my favorite parts and and overall style of this episode is how... It starts off very grounded, right? We're, like, still in that mobster type of uh, storytelling. And it becomes a horror movie once she enters Arkham Asylum. It is... And it, the camera is shaky. It's all handheld. The editing is really frantic. And um, as a viewer, we're spiraling down into uh, this sense of chaos and neuroticism that Sophia is also feeling and it is just so visceral it's so even with the music too the music is probably the most chaotic that we've seen it Mm -hmm. uh in 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 the entire series thus far these really strong strings right I I thought it was just absolutely awesome uh, it's disturbing to watch, but disturbing in such a great way. Yeah. Right? Because it's, it's horrific. It, it literally becomes a horror movie. And we also getting that perspective that she basically broke within Arkham, but prior to that, she was set up, mm-hmm. which is something I didn't 
realize going right? into it yeah, yeah which is such a subversion of the audience's expectations right because <laughs> even on last the last few episodes that we did where we talked about how she's a serial killer and like oh we're seeing this darker edge to her but now to find out the truth <clears throat> is such a a it's a twist that i yeah. really enjoyed well she's a product of her environment right mm, and i yeah. think that the coolest thing with this episode um because you did bring up already that like uh, oz is not in this episode a lot but the cool thing about this episode is that when he, oz is in a scene yeah. it plays a really important part into his journey hmm. and where he is currently especially in his relationship to sophia so you get a good glimpse like this episode basically opens um, with a little bit of uh, just a different look at the ending of last week's episode where you see from a different angle sort of what, from Sophia's perspective what happens hmm. um, when uh, the Maronis come and find out and they're basically holding Oz and Sophia at gunpoint um, and then Oz hops in the car with Victor and they and they speed off and she gets on the phone with um, uh, Theo Rossi's character, Dr. – what's his name? Dr. Stone, right? Hmm. I forget his first name. Um, yeah. I'll look it up. Uh, when the camera's not on me, but um, she gets on the phone with her psychiatrist, her doctor, who you come to find out she also met in Arkham. And what then we start to see in the first flashback is that Sophia was a very different person and a very different character prior to, um, like you said, being set up. So much so that she has a really great relationship with Oz as well. Mm. And you see it in... The way that later on in the episode you see Alberto calling him Penguin and she says don't call him that. Like mm. almost like don't yeah. mock him like he's a good guy. And you see yeah. Oz kind of always thinking one step ahead for Sophia. Maybe partly for his own benefit because mm. Carmine is his boss and he feels that he wants to live up to this expectation to eventually get to where he needs to get to. But you also see maybe for the first time he has a little bit of care for a character besides his mother. And maybe it's a female thing, which I also think is super interesting. Like the only character we've ever seen real true fluid care for from Oz's perspective throughout the show is his mother, Francis. But then mm. in these flashbacks, you see that he, he hands Sophia a cigarette. He jokes with her about being, being the suit and the face for, for the foundation. Um, she's giving these speeches at these luncheons with all these rich women. And it's so not what, we've seen of Sophia thus far. Yeah. And I think that's also such a credit to Miliati's performance and how oh, she yeah. just transforms throughout this episode. Oh yeah. Like a hundred percent. Like I literally think that, like I said before, she, I think outperforms a lot of people. Like let's get into the Mark strong stuff. Mm -hmm. Uh, because obviously John, uh, Totoro did not reprise his role as Carmine Falcone in here. Which wasn't a choice, hmm. by the way. It was a scheduling conflict, so yeah. it's not that he didn't want to return to the role. I'm pretty sure he was filming season two of Apple's Severance, so he yes. wasn't able to come back, and they had to recast him, and they got Mark Strong, like you were talking about. Yeah, and uh, Mark Strong is a great actor. Uh, however, I just don't think he fits Carmine. I think Totoro had a very natural intimidation of being this mob boss right he was very smooth with it. it reminded me of joe pesci from the irishman right just saw like this very slow like oh yeah like mm -hmm. type of deal but just right on the nail he had the aesthetic he had the vibe uh strong feels miscasted here feels a little like he's trying too hard or like he's almost missing the direction mm -hmm. of what the character is supposed to be uh and i feel all the incredible episode and not really a shot at mark strong like i said because he's an incredible actor i just don't think it was a right the right role for him at all because uh, uh miliotti here is absolutely outperforming him like that dinner table scene mm -hmm. where i don't remember mom being sick or ever depressed like that emotion that she portrays there and then obviously further down the line in arkham and then her snap i l love the moment where she ends up breaking and yeah. bashes that girl's head in and it's like magpie yeah and yes. she, she just she just becomes wild and seeing that development 
and now seeing her present day, uh, just what a what a performance! It's too. like an acting showcase. I think this episode, like this, yeah. could be studied for people. And oh, I yeah. think that um, what you were talking about the scene when she's when she's having a conversation with her father, it's not only the way she's she's delivering the confusion and the questioning of her father, but also the fear that she also has on top of all of that. Yeah. Uh, there's so much in this episode, especially in the different relationships that she has, and you start to see them all unfold in in the span of one hour, and it's really remarkable what she does in her performance, whether it's a conversation with Carmine, the great conversation she has with her brother when he's exiting the car, and she's like, you know, like, and it was very reminiscent of The Sopranos where she's like, you know, like, like, did you ever, like, you ever see things like the real side of dad that I haven't seen? And like, he, she's like, you know, like we have to lie when we were kids. It's like very reminiscent of like what, um, AJ and, and, and Meadow, Meadow had to do yeah. in Sopranos for, for Tony. And, uh, there's so much nuance in this episode with her and her performance. Um, Arkham, you've already brought it up a little bit. The, the score you talked about, Mick Giacchino, Michael Giacchino's son does the score for the show, which is so awesome. Oh, I did not know that was his son. Cause I was looking it up and I was like, is he going by like an, a no, it's his, it's, his, it's his son. So, and okay. keeping it in the family, I mean, Giacchino's yeah. moved on now to do, he's still obviously doing composing, but he's now directing. He did Werewolf by Night for Marvel and yeah. stuff like that. So I don't know if, if Mick has kind of taken over the family business, so to speak, which is yeah. ironic based in this episode. But he does such a great job with this and establishing the tone of Arkham, which it's so great to see Arkham basically on full display in this episode, mm. even though it's for a short amount of time, because it is built in the comics as like this absolute worst possible place oh, that yeah. you can go. And for someone who's innocent like Sophia – and someone who actually was the only member of the Falcone family, or it seemingly looks like, that had a heart, that cared. I mean, hmm. she met with Summer. Uh, I forget the, the reporter's full name. I know it's Summer is the first name. Hmm. But she meets with the reporter um, to, to really actually indulge and really listen because she's starting to question whether or not it, her mother actually did kill herself or that if her father had something maybe to do with her death or, or had something like maybe her father was the one that sort of had somebody get rid of her, so to speak. And we also see that in the Batman when, um, Totoro's version of the character, Carmine, um, tells all these women that work at the club, like, Oh, you got a problem. Like well, I'll get rid of it for you. And it always leads to them dying. Yeah. So it's really interesting to see that dynamic play out in flashback. And Sophia sort of seeing all of it unfold basically with Mark Strong's performance. Cause I didn't want to comment on that. I agree with what you're saying. I think one thing that's hard because I don't know what the conversations were like with Mark's cause there's a lot of different parts to it, right? Like Matt mm. Reeves is also not the director. Yeah. You know what I yeah. mean? And Mark Strong, I don't know if he's going to show up on other episodes so far. He's only in this episode. This is not the director of the first three episodes. You got a new director for this one. Um, and so I don't know if like that director sort of like a day player, so to speak, he's only coming in for this bottle episode about Sophia. Mm. Um, but the other complicated part with it is that the, th the thing is like the Batman's an $800 million movie, right? It made close to a billion dollars. Tons mm. of people saw it. People love Batman as a character and people love that movie. Um, and we've seen this character on screen before as Totoro. The question is like, do they say to Mark Strong, do your best to be like him because mm -hmm. that could be another part of the struggle in that. You know what I mean? It's like, well, we couldn't get to Toro, but like we need to still kind of stay true to who his, what his nature is. Yeah. So try to do like a mimic. And that's hard because Mark Strong's also a British actor. Totoro is an American actor. Yeah. So he's already got to work on an accent. He's got to have this aura about him that is similar to Totoro. And I do agree with what you're saying. I think Totoro, what Totoro possessed in his portrayal of Carmine resembled a lot of what the end of this episode was for Sophia. And you felt that like that was yeah. exactly that, that um, Falcone sort of sort of uh, trajectory and that through line. And I think that strong just had to play it up a little bit because that's not in his skill set, so to speak, you know, like mm. it might not, he's played these British gangsters. He's done that, but this is, this is different. It's a very visceral sort of character. And it's yeah. something that he has to radiate this, this real, feeling of of terror from everybody around him and you just didn't get it necessarily with his performance but um talk to me more about the arkham sequences too and things you liked in the arkham stuff yeah i mean like i mentioned before the director here who is helen helen shaver 
does such a great job within its presentation, right? It's, I, I don't want to sound like a broken record here, but like I mentioned before, a horror movie. And it's so perfectly horrific in almost every way. Uh, but also, like you mentioned, how this does a really great job of showing that Arkham is one of the worst places in this world. And we've never really seen it on full display in any sort of uh, film adaptation of the Batman world yet. And this shows you how corrupt, right? Everything in Gotham is corrupt. Yeah. The police are corrupt, but also the psychiatric system is corrupt. Like, they're literally, like, putting two inmates against each other, almost like a dog fight, right? And the, the other inmate, inmate has uh, ends up killing herself with the fork and it's so tragic and it's that word that i keep repeating horrific it does such a great job though of putting us within the mindset of sophia and uh it it's just also the doctor played by theo ross well i want to ask you something mm -hmm. because what do you think Christina has, or Sophia has that moment with him in the present day, basically saying, like, yo, I, I know you're trying to use me here, yada, yada, yada. Do you think he's going to play a significance further down the line here? I or? think his relationship with Sophia means something. I hmm. think there wouldn't be a reason why we didn't also get that reveal in episode two, I think it was, hmm. about their yeah. relationship early on and the way he's holding her close to him. And I don't know if it's, if there's an infatuation. You get a moment. Uh, within one of the sequences when Sophia is getting electroshock therapy where she grabs his hand, not yeah. in a romantic way, but more of a way like, help me. Yeah. And he kind of is the one that eventually has like the heart to be like, this needs to stop. And he's talking to the other doctor about it. Um, I don't know if I believe in the theory we had last week where yeah, he's going to play Scarecrow. <laughs> yeah. I don't think that's necessarily something that I can see, but I do think that he's going to play a significant part um, in her story, necessarily. Um, she also gets on the phone with him in the beginning of this episode. That So he's the one that obviously comes to her rescue, essentially, when, when all the shit goes down at the end of episode three. Um, I do think he'll play a role. I don't know necessarily what, he's gonna, what role he's going to play for her. Um, and we also do see at the end of this episode that she kind of takes out the whole family. Yeah. Um, and so she's basically alone. At this yeah, point, she doesn't yeah. have anybody else. She doesn't have her brother. She has no other members of the family, essentially. Um, she doesn't have Oz yeah. anymore. So, except for John Vitti. Johnny Vitti is he? Yeah. Did he get out? Did he escape? He, she. The episode ended with him going to his bedroom. Oh yes, you're right. You're right. Gun. So what? What is he? What's she gonna do there? Yes. You know. So we'll have to see. And wow. he's kind of been the pawn. Yeah. Like throughout this whole show, um, yeah. which maybe is why they get an actor with such gravitas. I mean, Michael Kelly's a great actor. Yeah. Um, so I'm interested to see what happens with that. Um, with Arkham in particular, though, the big thing for me is just how well they portray these different versions of psychotic behavior, right? Mm -hmm. Like you talked about the one woman um, who kills herself in the prison. I'm trying to find out. Uh, exactly what actress it was because I don't want to because she deserves a she deserves a shout out I want to oh, say it was was Isabella the name of the character no Isabella is the cousin right hmm. I'm trying to find well Ma Magpie was played by um, Marie Botha and she does a great job yeah. um, as well but the one who the one who comes out and stabs herself in the neck like what a psycho like made her look and and her performance is just like this is a scary woman like yeah. i can't even believe that this is happening and you get that very much from the first indication um but all the scenes in arkham to me felt very like you said like very horror-esque and it made you feel for sophia as a character and at the end when you get the juxtaposition of going from the environment she was in in arkham to this very calm nature about it in which she's talking to the family, but also presenting this different version of herself there. She's also accepting of herself because mm. we had talked about it. I think in maybe it was the first episode we recorded, but um, she has all these scars that we find out how she gets them in mm. Arkham. Yeah. Uh, and she was covering them up with, with necklaces and with these dresses that like are high up on the neck to kind of hide these scars. 
that she has because yeah. she's she doesn't really know how to feel about them. She doesn't know how to react to them. She's still now she's out in the world and people are looking at her like she's a murderer, and she never saw herself as that. In this, she's wearing a very revealing dress. She's yeah. allowing her scars yeah. to sort of be seen by everybody, and she's not afraid anymore. Yeah. What did you think about that transformation that we see over time? Yeah, that's actually a good point that I didn't realize with the dress and the costumes. And it's such a powerful dress, too. It's that bright yellow. It stands mm -hmm. out. Like, you're in a crowd of, of, of black and white suits, it stands out. Uh, and I didn't even realize that. Thank you for pointing that out to me. But, yeah, the transformation that we see is so infatuating. And it, it it's very batman gotham coded i think right because that it's like it's very almost super villain like getting and i i like it right it's still grounded within its realistic crime drama storytelling mm -hmm. but we're having this uh quote-unquote girl boss moment right yeah. and she's just she wipes everyone out gasses the house and like is twirling around the house with her yellow dress uh, with a gas mask on. It's very like it's a great visual. Yeah, it great is. visual. It's very bat. Like that's what I mean. Like Batman Gotham coded. Mm -hmm. Like that's so super villain, right? But yeah. in a, it, but also in a very almost anti hero way because you know yeah. she has, she's not entirely a bad person. You know she's not, and she has her reasons, and these are. A family that is constantly screwed her over and screwed her over and screwed her over. So, I mean, hell yeah, I guess. <laughs> yeah, no, I think I think what you were just talking about too is is really like I, I wanted I want to credit like the creative team behind this show every week because yeah. you think about it too. Like, there's certain episodes of television shows where, I mean, again, the name of the show is the Penguin. The show is supposed to be based around Oz's character, and you're now taking basically an hour out of your eight hour arc to tell a story. Cause even with Victor's story last week, I mean, yeah. Victor might have 10 minutes of backstory. And then it's really about the relationship between Victor and Oz. Hmm. And you have it play out in these scenes and you have it, like I said, a little bit in this with Oz and Sophia, and we, we should get to in a little bit, maybe talking about how Oz kind of turns, turns her over to her father. Cause hmm. we haven't really discussed that yet. But the big thing is that, it's a lot of trust in your audience and a lot of confidence as a creator to then completely pivot and mm. say, we are going to do an hour on an entirely different character yeah. that you're not tuning in to watch. And if you're not compelling enough in your narrative, that can really lose people, you know, like that can oh, yeah. really shift people's perspective and be like, why are we following like this character? So a credit is to the creative team to be so strong in the direction and the writing of this episode. And obviously Chris and Miliati, who does such a great job as Sophia, because some backstory episodes can feel very flat. And this, like we said, might be the best episode of the series so far. Like this show just keeps getting better and better and better week by week. Um, so I just think that's so, that's so great to have that ability and belief in the creative team to just say, yeah, go do that. Hmm. Because sometimes you don't get that, especially with a show, like we said, that's based in so much IP yeah. as the Batman universe and yeah. the Penguin. You know? Yeah. Yeah. No, I a hundred percent understand that. I do. I, I want to also, I think another great moment I want to highlight going back to that gassing of the house. Mm -hmm. uh, she has that moment with the kid, right? So, crazy scene <laughs> yeah and it's kind of leading to you down this like okay what is she doing with this kid you you end up finding out very shortly after that basically saving her life mm. from killing everyone else but then you also think like she she's basically breeding another version of her in a sense yeah right because this kid's gonna be like Yo, my mom, you just murdered my mom. Yeah. You just murdered everyone. <laughs> like, this kid's going to grow up now an orphan. So, it's, uh, I'm curious if they're going to highlight that later on, you know, especially since we, we are given a significant amount of time with the two of them in that greenhouse. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, uh, yeah, I think I'm excited to see where the rest of the series goes. This is like, we're at the midpoint and it's so unpredictable, yeah. right? Like the, the point we left off with Oz, we have no clue where that's going to go yeah. with the Maronis now. And now the Falcons are basically wiped off the map because 
the daughter it just killed everyone. Killed everybody. So, um, it is. But I love this. I love the fact that I have absolutely no <laughs> clue what these next four episodes are going to be. I like. feel the same way. And the thing that's like we get theorized all we want, but it's like, like part of me is like I wish they kept Sophia alive. But at the same mm. time, it's like realistically at the end of this series, someone has to come out on top. Yeah. And it feels like it probably won't be Salvatore Moroni. I mean, he's currently in prison. Now he's he's got... But who knows? Because now they have the most probably manpower, so to speak, yeah. there. Then you have Oz. And obviously, like we talked about in our first review for the show, you want to see the transformative moment of Oz being the Penguin. Yeah. Even though that's a moniker that he obviously hates. And we see it again in this episode pop up a few times. I think he's called the Penguin like three or four times. Yeah. Um, and... But Sophia, like you said, is this badass girl boss, incredible performance, and you want to see if something else becomes of her. And I'm I'm curious too. Like I don't know where they're gonna go with these four oh, episodes because yeah. they have to wrap up stuff with her. This is still a story about Oz. We have again, we still haven't seen his mother in two episodes. That's another, and thing. that's super yeah. significant. Like we still, there has to be something else with Francis and him. Yeah, there's yeah. gonna be something significant. It might be Sophia kidnapping francis like that's, that's what the, i'm thinking yeah. right because it's that emotional tie that were established really early on so now that the rivalry between sophia and oz is basically uh you know fired up again this is gonna she's gonna latch on to 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 everything there was a great line in this movie or this episode <clears throat> right where carmine uh, it's it is alluded to that Oz told Carmine about Sophia going to the reporter, right? And Sophia's in the back of Oz's car and says uh, she has a line. I, I'm gonna paraphrase here, yeah. but she basically has a line where she says to Oz, she's like, Oh, so this is what you wanted. Like you want it to be seen now. Well now my father sees you and you know what he also sees he, he he knows you now but he also knows everyone you know and love and if you ever f- fuck up then he's going to go after those people that you know and love which is i think a really intentional line they put mm-hmm. there because now by the end of this episode we see Sophia become Carmine in a sense like embody that sense of her father and she, what she said to us is gonna, my, in my, in my bet is that a hundred percent by the end of the series, she's going to portray that same sense of power. Where, oh Oz, I know you. You wanna, you wanna, you wanna get yourself seen in this city. Well, I know you, and I know everyone you love too. Yeah. So I'm gonna go after your mother. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I think that we're gonna start to see the demise. Of everybody around him just collapse. Yeah. And Victor's yeah. going to, unfortunately, I think, also be one of those things that... And it's it's hard because with his character, regardless of him having maybe a care, like we saw in last week's episode with, with Victor, and we've seen the first two weeks with uh, Francis and with uh, the season so far with Carmen Ajogo's character, the um, prostitute. I can't think of her name right now. I think it's Eve. Hmm. But... Um, we're going to see all those characters die off. like, mm. And it's going to be because of Sophia or maybe the Moronis or maybe both of them. And I think that final nail in the coffin is going to be a situation in which it's basically going to have to be like a double sacrifice. Like Sophia and Francis are both going to have to go. And it's going to end with Oz sort of – he had to make that sacrifice. Like yeah. he, to, to be the, the head of Gotham's crime unit um, or crime scene is essentially, the, the gangster scene. These are the sacrifices you have to make, yeah. and uh, you you work hard, and you got to be slimy, and you got to do what you have to do. Because regardless of thinking, maybe this character has a care for people, he he he's still always doing everything for himself. Oh, and yeah. that's the thing you yeah. have to remind yourself as a viewer: like Oz is a shitty person, <laughs> like he genuinely is. Yeah, and every single thing is with the intention of just helping himself. Hmm. Um, I am so intrigued with what the potential future is going to be with his character with future villains. Like, cause we doesn't have much interaction, if any at all. I, I don't think with Riddler in the first, in the first um, movie, 
Like it's more so just him dealing with the Falcons and yeah. and stuff. I think he has like one or two interactions with uh, with Gordon, but like nothing yeah. with the fantastical elements that you alluded to. And it's like if we get these Court of Owls in in, in the second movie, or we get Mister Freeze, like the two yeah. most heavily rumored um, characters that we may see, like. What is that going to look like? Yeah. Because he's going to run the grounded crime element of it with running the drugs and running the weapons mm. and, and building this new army, essentially, in yeah. Gotham. And but, there's also the Joker, the Barry yes. Gilligan's Joker, which yes. is a crazy which hasn't wild been, card. Hasn't even been established. Like I was thinking about that today. It's like the only reason – and if you guys are watching this for the first time, thank you, obviously. But like people may not be privy to the information that – the Joker exists technically in Matt Reeves' universe because yeah. in the real canon of the first film, he doesn't exist. It's a deleted yeah. scene. Now, he did yeah. release that scene online to maybe get people more eyeballs on it maybe, but he has to still introduce his Joker in one way or another. It's not yeah. like we need an origin story. We've I've, seen it. We did see the the laugh when the Riddler yes, goes. Yes, right. at the end. Of, at the end. So, yeah. so there's an introduction that people are aware that he exists. And like I said, they're not going to do an origin story with Joker. Like yeah. they, we've seen it before. Um, but that's another thing he has to juggle and he has to deal with. So it's interesting, man. But, but in terms of the Sophia stuff, I mean, Kristen Milioti, I think, locked up a nomination for this and maybe even a win. Mm. Uh, I mean, she's so fantastic in this episode and there's so much left to go with, with her character oh, and to see what's going to happen with Oz and, and, all that stuff. I mean, I don't think we're going to get another uh, episode in Arkham either this season, but mm. also just made me so excited for the potential of maybe having a, like a darker horror esque, like really psychological Arkham show from the same creative team. Yeah. No, I, I would love that. I would absolutely love yeah, that. Me too. It'd be cool. But anything else? I feel like we cover most of the episode. Yeah. Nothing really. Uh, it's just, it's a great episode yeah. from beginning to end. Aside from, you know, it has some, there's, you can nitpick parts of it, but overall, the sense of scale this episode, the sense of feeling and sensation this episode brings and character is, I think, unmatched thus yeah. far. So yeah. this is my favorite episode thus far of the season, but we shall see. We still have four more episodes, so. Yeah, oh. yeah, yeah. Did we lose the camera? We lost the camera. Well, um... We can just wrap up anyway because we're wrapping up the episode. Um, Vinny can maybe give a sign off just audio wise, but uh, let us know in the comments what your guys' thoughts are in terms of the penguin in this episode. Uh, it is definitely a lot of people's favorite episode. It has a 9.6 currently on IMDb. It's one of the highest rated television episodes of all time already, uh, and it's definitely one of my favorite episodes, if not my favorite of the season so far. And it's going to be really um, symbolic of what is to come with the show going forward in this universe. Um, but be sure to give a like on this video if you guys can and comment your thoughts on the episode Chantani below. Also, if you could subscribe to us, we have the culture Wave media network. We do all things film and TV. We got a lot of other exciting stuff coming for you guys down the pipeline as well. And you guys can subscribe to us on social media. All that stuff is down below. Uh, and you guys can follow us on all the social media platforms and share with your friends. I'm going to sign off. I am Darren Scalamoni. And it's been me, Vinny Albano. And we will see you guys next time. This is The Culture.